So welcome everybody, welcome to my talk. Ansible, you know, the tool that should be in the toolbox of every DevOps engineer. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for choosing my talk. I know there's a lot of talks happening at the same time, so thank you for choosing this one. And of course this will work. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Vladimir Dianovic. This is my Twitter, my mail, my GitHub account, my blog, if you want to follow me online or contact me online. Originally, I'm from Serbia and beautiful city of Amsterdam, uh, Belgrade. But now I live in the Netherlands and the beautiful city of Amsterdam. I'm part of professional IT scene since 2006. In other words, I'm getting paid to develop software since 2006. And I work on all kinds of projects, companies, you know, like you name it, I did it. My day job is senior director of B2C and B2B technology at PVH. PVH is a fashion tech company behind brands such as Kevin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger. My night job is basically the founder and leader of Amsterdam Java user group, so I don't get a lot of sleep. And also I'm speaker at conferences around the world, so I've been like almost to any continent that exists. Also I'm Java One Rockstar and Code One Star. But enough about me. So what this talk is going to be about. First, I'm going to explain the motivation for this talk, you know, and why should we care about tools like Ansible in the first place. Then we will going to look at Ansible on a high level, basically what Ansible is, what Ansible isn't, for what it should be used, for what it shouldn't be used, things like that. And after which we're going to look into basically the building blocks of Ansible, basically the, the stuff that you know like Ansible consists of, and that we are going to use in day-to-day -day work if we choose to use Ansible. At the end, there will be some time for questions. So if you have any questions, please wait until the end, or you can always contact me online or, or afterwards in, in a conference. Uh, all the things that I'm going to share with you come from my own personal experience. So take everything uh, with a grain of salt. And again, like, you know, your use case might be different than mine. So what's even the reason for this talk? Why should we care about tools like Ansible? Before we answer this question, let us look at the landscape that we actually all work with, you know, like where actually like our code lives, basically the places where, you know, like we need to maintain, make sure that, you know, like all is good. So where we can actually put our code today. So of course, there are still physical servers, right? So we can say, okay, I want for my code to run actually on a physical server. If we choose to do that, then it means also that we need to make sure that they're up to date, that they're maintained, that they are secure and like all the life cycle management needs to be taken care of, right? Of course, then there are virtual machines, right? Maybe we don't care about the physical machines we, and physical servers. We want to put everything that we actually do in virtual machines, either on the prem or in cloud or wherever. But again, we come with the same problem, kind of. Again, we need to make sure that they are maintained, that they are up to date, that there is no security flaws. You know, again, the whole life cycle management kicks in. And again, in this case, probably with physical servers, somebody else is, you know, it's somebody else's job, not ours. So easier for us. Again, you know, maybe we're even fancier than that. So maybe we put all our stuff in containers, right? And in this case, we probably don't care about VMs. We don't care about physical machines. Again, it's somebody else's problem. For what we only care is, okay, like our code and, the code and basically what we put in containers. But again, this doesn't mean that, you know, it's carefree. We still need to make sure that they're like up to the day that they're like actually you know, like there's a still life cycle management happening here. We need to make sure again this everything is secure, that all stuff that actually goes into container is up to the date and correct. And there's of course the latest and the greatest, you know, we're serverless, where we don't care about anything else except our own code and basically the functions that actually runs it, while everything else is you know taken care of by somebody else. Well, reality of a life is that basically all these things are present still. And again, in a lot of situations, there are all of those texts are present in the same company, and they're going to be present for a long, long years actually coming in years to come. The reason for that is very simple. Every single basically stack here has a pros as a, and a cons. In certain situations, certain stack here is very good to be used. In certain situations, it's not really ideal to be used. But again, you know, like all of them have pros and cons, and they're going to stay here with us for a long time to come, which again means that we need to make sure that they're up to date, there's life cycle management happening, that everything is secure and in a good way. 
and that we need to you know, somehow take care of all of this. And let's also not forget about this guy here, right? This is something that's very often overlooked. But again, if you think about it, every single person in your company has actually one of those, right? Doesn't matter if they're a developer or not developer, engineer, whatever, they will have one, which is again, how easy it is actually for a new person who actually come, especially if it's a developer, to set up all the tools and all the things that they need to do their day-to-day -day job. You know, in some companies it's like two minutes, you know, it's just one click, everything is taken care of for you. In some it's basically you get the whole script and basically the Confluence page say install this, install this, set up this, set up this, and again, you know, how is this for things to go wrong? And again, like if thing goes wrong, then how easy it is to basically go back to the good state? This is why we came to a very simple conclusion Then we should treat everything as a code, right? We should basically treat everything as a code, put it in the version control system, have a whole history, what's there, who edited it, when it was edited. We can add code reviews, we can do all kind of checks, and basically, and we have like, you know, much better, like, like a management and much easier life. Also, like, if we do the code reviews, it means that, you know, if I created something, somebody else is going to look at it and make sure that I covered all the edge cases. And like, and again, like there can be a lot of them. Also, if we had figure out after some time, okay, we have some bugs, we have some issues, we can basically fix them, add them basically to the code, and again, everybody's going to benefit from it right away, in a very easy way. And again, in this case, we make sure that errors are not going to happen over and over again, you know, like something basically, somebody just forgot to run some line, or something like that. Also, if we treat everything as a code, then basically this is much easier, right? Because then it's much easier for us to actually automate everything. And again, like, I don't think, I think that, you know, like, hopefully now we're, like, in a time that actually everybody understands that this shouldn't be an optional thing, and we shouldn't, like, choose do we want to automate or not. We should automate everything, and for a sim very simple reason. We as a people are basically, you know, not great in repetitive tasks. We make mistakes. We forget steps. We basically, you know, take the shortcuts. If you say to basically the same person, okay, do every single day, same list of tasks, the good chances they are going to at one point not to do it. Machines, on the other hand, are great at that. They basically, they're perfect in doing repetitive tasks over and over and over and over again. They're always going to do whatever is written in the code. It's, you know, not what we want them to do, but actually like what we wrote them to do, right? So, you know, with automating everything, we basically get better, better quality. So if we have everything as a code and we automate everything, then of course this will lead to repeatability. Because again, our machines and states and ports and firewalls and everything will be actually set up every single time in a good way. You know, we would not have to think, okay, like did I basically went SH to every single machine and open this port, we will know, okay, like everything is a code, everything is automated, it's done. Also this will lead to better reliability. We will know exactly what's actually happened, what, who approved it, who did code review, basically, we will have the, the trail of everything. Again, more eyes checking stuff will make sure that of course we end up with the less bugs in production, right? So the same thing as the code, like if we do the code reviews, likelihood of basically go, bugs going into production is less, instead of we ju basically we just you know, commit and push to production. This of course leads to stability. We will get better stability of our systems, and basically, again, we will make sure that all corner cases are covered because more people are going to look at it. Again, like I said, if we have some issue, we have some bug, we will basically put it in the code, automated pipelines will actually kick in, do it on all the machines, we will make sure that, you know, like all the holes are plugged. Also, you know, this of course then leads to better quality of the software. Because we, again, we can, if we have everything as a code, we can add tests to it, you know? Again, like, I know that people usually don't like to write unit tests, right? Who likes to write unit tests? Yeah. Yeah, like I said, like a very small number of people, right? But I think that we all understand the need for tests. And again, like if we treat everything as a code, then we will be able to do that. Results of all of this, uh, we, as the benefits are very obvious. Basically, we'll, we will get better performance and we will get you know, better speed. Again, our speed to market will be much faster because again, if we have everything as a code, if we have everything automated, then our basically life cycle are going to be much, much shorter. And the cycles that we actually need to actually do something 
and push it to production, push it to all machines, it's going to be much faster. And of course, with that, we get better performance, we get better speed. If we have any bugs or issues, we'll make sure that it's like covered all the time, it's covered everywhere, that like in, we're the, just going from the better state to better and better and better state. And again, if we go to the worst state, we will not be in a, in a situation where we can very easily go back to the previous state, which was better. Okay, so let us now look at what is the Ansible. So Ansible is a tool which is responsible for multiple tasks. And if you go on, on internet and basically search, okay, what Ansible is, the first thing that you're going to find is this. It's configuration management. And you know, like as the name itself it says, you probably guessed it, it's help us basically configuring all kinds of machines. So, and again, like, you know, if we go back to the beginning of, of my talk where I said, okay, what kind of stacks we have today, like physical servers, you know, VMs, all these kind of things, all those things need to be configured and all those things can be configured for the Ansible. So Ansible is a very good tool in basically configuring all, all kinds of machines. One great characteristic of, of Ansible is in the, I can never pr pronounce this, in the, in the impotent. What it means actually is you know, that uh, if we rerun again and again and again the same kind of scripts, we're always going to end up in the same state, which I know from, for, from your point of view, but from my point of view, it's great. Because you know, like if I'm in doubt, okay, did I run this script or not? Did I basically these machines get updated or not? I can just rerun it again, and Ansible will do all the hard work for me. So again, like it's, it's you know, one less thing that I need to worry about. Because I think that everybody, like whoever at some point of life dealt with you know, databases and some updates, were always you know, like, oh, did I run this script or not? You know, like if I write again, like, will it actually going to crash my production or everything's going to be good, you know? Because again, like if you do it manually, you need to think about these things. In case of Ansible, it's already taken care of for you. The way how Ansible actually does that is very clever. And when we actually tell Ansible what we need to do, basically what needs to be done, we don't say Ansible how to do it. We say to Ansible, okay, you know what? This is basically the machine. This is the end state I want for that machine to be into. And then the Ansible figure out the part how. Which means then basically if the machine is already in that state, Ansible will say, okay, done. I don't have to do anything here. and just going to walk away. Another thing that also Ansible is, is basically orchestration management. Again, we can orchestrate and basically order in order in what things basically are going to happen. And again, you're like, so not only the, like uh, uh, the task itself on a machine, but also like the order of basically we want to manage such machine. So for example, you know, like we want to make sure that the database is up and running and up to the date before we actually start up the web server, right? And again, we also want to make sure that the web server is up and running and it's like able to accept the traffic from the end users before we open the load balancer to it, right? So those kind of things. Basically, Ansible makes all those things very easy. Uh, one important thing that I want to, to make sure that you bring from this talk is to remember that Ansible is only one of the tools out there that can do all of those kind of things. So there is also Chef, then there is Puppet, there is Salt, and also there is Ansible. So there are a lot of tools out there who are actually trying to solve the same things. And again, there are subtle differences. Some basically do one thing better, rather do worse. But again, like it also comes back to you know, your personal preferences and things like that, but again, the Ansible is only just one of these tools. So if you, if you go, walk out of this talk and think Ansible is not the right tool for me, please look at other tools because maybe the other tools will be better for, you, for your use case. Another thing that I also want to stress out is that Ansible is only one piece of a puzzle. So again, like we have like very complex ecosystems and problems that we're trying to solve and Ansible is, should be only basically just one piece of a puzzle to actually help us do that part, do that. So we need to still to add additional tools, additional stuff around it to actually solve our own personal problems. Again, which tools you're going to put into place and basically around Ansible and you know, complement the Ansible, again, it comes back to your personal use cases and what you're trying to do. The great thing about Ansible is it's very, very flexible. So it can be in the driving seat. Ansible can do almost anything that you can think of. You know, like even like if you want to, for example, to manage the infrastructure of Amazon Web Services, things like that, you know, there are two, basically there are like modules and ways to do it in Ansible. I'm not saying that you should do that. Again, like you, know, like you can do ridiculous amount of stuff in Ansible. So again, you need to choose, okay, like does it make sense to do it in Ansible or not? The fact that I can do it doesn't mean that I should do it. 
again, the great thing about Ansible and how flexible it is that, again, like I said, it can be in driving seat, but also it can be just a lending a hand to other tools into ecosystem to actually, you know, to solve the bigger problems. It is very, very, very flexible and it's very easy to combine Ansible with other tools to actually solve any kind of complex problem that you have in any kind of ecosystem. Okay, so we talked about basically why we should care about tools like Ansible. We talked a little bit about Ansible at a higher level. So let us now actually look at what are the building blocks that Ansible consists of. The first and the most important part of Ansible is basically inventory. Inventory is basically a file where you actually say to Ansible, okay, this is the machines that I want to take for you to actually to work with. Again, from Ansible point of view, it doesn't care. Is it like physical machine, VM, Docker image, you know, whatever. It can work with anything. So in a nutshell, you know, let's assume that, like I said, like, let's assume these are the machines that we want to control for Ansible and, you know, to manage for Ansible and orchestrate. And again, this can be anything. From the laptop, physical server, you know, like the, the big, you know, supercomputers, anything. Like I said, Ansible doesn't really care about it. The only thing that it cares is that we provide inventory file. It's something like this. Again, you can provide the inventory file in multiple ways. So Ansible, you can put it like in the default location on the hard drive. Basically, you can put it like in a special directory where the playbooks are and you know, things like that. Again, multiple ways how you can provide one, but you need to provide one. Here we actually, what we're doing is listing all the machines or nodes that we want to control for Ansible and actually we organize them in some logical blocks, groups. So in this case here I'm saying, okay, I have a, basically I have a group called the load balancer and I have a machine in that group which is called LB01. I think that everybody knows what the load balancer is, right? Uh, then I, here I'm saying, okay, I have another group which is called a web server and in this group I have basically two machines Web, server, web 01 and Web 02. Then here I have basically two more groups. Basically I have a group we call backend and in that group I have one machine, back 01, and also have a database and in that group I have server DB01. So if you go basically back to this picture, it would look something like this. So we have some machines in one group, some other machines in another group, and some other machines in the first group, right? Something like that, kinda. <coughs> then we have also this. I call it here control, and in my case, this is kinda special group. From Ansible point of view, it doesn't really care. It's just a group. And as you can see here, I'm putting my local host here in this group called control, and I have something here. I'll come back to this later. So if you go back to the visual representation, it would look something like this. So I'll have one machine which is in control group and some other machines, some other groups. Basically how it works with Ansible is that it goes like this. Basically control is a special machine and the control is actually a machine which controls all other machines for the Ansible. In the case of Ansible, and again this differ from the tool, tool to the tool, in the case of Ansible, Ansible needs to be present only on control machine. So only there. So there is no any agents or anything running on other machines. Again, like I said, in, so, in some cases of some other tools, you need basically to have like a control and then on every machine you need to have a client. In this case, on, on basically on the client nodes, you don't need to have anything. The one thing that you need to remember is that control machine at the moment, at least, can't be Windows machine. So that's, that's the limitation. All other nodes, basically the managed nodes, they can be Linux, Mac, Windows, whatever, you know, so there is everything is possible. In case of control machine, Windows is not possible at the moment. Uh, communication between the control machine or, or control node and managed nodes is SSH by default. So but if you don't put anything spe special there, it's going to assume, okay, I'm going to basically SSH to this machine, which again means that you have to basically have like, you know, like appropriate you know, username, password, and all those kind of things that you either need to have default set up or basically some keys and there are different ways how to do it. And that is why basically here I have this special line. Because again, you know, going from my local host to my local host through SSH, well yeah, you can do it, but I don't think that's the best option, right? So basically here I'm saying, okay, you know what? My control machine basically is my local host, so I, you know, just look, use local connection. The good thing why actually, well, good practice why you should also 
always put control machine in Ansible files, in inventory, is that you can also then make sure that it's up to date and you can manage it in, in the same way. Again, automate everything. Everything is a code. Don't do anything manually. Uh, just one small thing. Basically, I'll, I'll come back to here. But again, like, although I said that, it, like I said, Ansible needs to be present only on control node, in certain cases, you need to add certain stuff to basically to, uh, to manage those. But I'll come back to this also later. OK, so now we basically talked about inventory. So let's talk about the next big block. And that's basically modules. Uh, modules are in the easiest way to look at like basically the units of tasks that Ansible needs to do. And there are multiple ways how you can actually work with modules. The most simplest way is basically for the command line. And again, if you're just starting with Ansible and just playing with some modules, this is a very good way to start. You're like first try, try it for the console, when you actually figure out what, how it actually needs to work, then basically, you know, edit in, in basically in, as a code. So how you actually do it? Well, of course, you say Ansible, then you say minus M, and then you pass basically the name of the module that you want for Ansible actually to run. In this case, it's basically a module called command. And again, this, uh, this module is going to just run any kind of command on the managed node. Then what we also like do is, again, if module supports arguments, then we say minus A, and then we provide basically the list of arguments. Again, depending from the module, it's, it's, it can be slightly different. In this case, because it's command module, I'm just going to provide basically as an argument command that I want to run on all, basically to, to, to be run on managed nodes, and in this case, it's only host name. The last but not the least is basically I need to tell to Ansible, okay, okay, I said, okay, I want to run this module, this is the arguments, okay, then we need to say where. So here, I said all, which means that basically Ansible is going to go through my inventory file and select all the machines from there and run this command everywhere. Again, you don't have to put it here all. You can here, you can put like the machine names, you can put group names, you can put like multiple whole, basically machine names or multiple group names. You can put like regular expressions. It's very flexible way, you know, what you can provide here. If you're like just lazy and want to run it everywhere, you just put all and that's it, build done. Like I said, you know, like just check the like, you know, documentation for multi to see different ways how you can run all, all the commands. The next block that we look into is basically a playbook. Uh, simply put, a playbook is collection basically of the task that needs to be run on, on the managed nodes. Uh, because again, like you probably figured it out yourself that if the only way that you can run modules is through the command line, then the Ansible wouldn't be a very useful tool. Because again, what would we end up doing is okay, writing a lot of shell scripts basically with Ansible, calling Ansible and the modules, and again, then what's the difference in actually doing the shell commands ourselves, right? So my much better way is basically use the playbooks, and the playbooks is, I would say, kind of heart of, of Ansible. So here's a very simple example of how the one playbook would look like. As you can see, it's YAML, so if you don't like YAML, tough luck. Yeah. Uh, basically, it starts very simply. First, we say, okay, host, on which this playbook will be run. So in this case, I'm saying, okay, database, which means the group database from my inventory file. Then the next uh, thing is basically we define the tasks which needs to be run. And again, we need, like I said, like, it can be like multiple tasks here. So again, like, that's why I said, like, you don't have to run, run the whole bash scripts and say, okay, run this Ansible module, then this Ansible module. We just basically put it here and Ansible will take care of for us. So for every task, basically, we can start with the name. Again, this is optional. If you don't want to put the name, Ansible will choose one for you. In this case, I'm saying, putting a descriptive name, which is called like install MySQL, so everybody can figure out what actually it is, right? Again, good, uh, good practice is actually to add the names, because when you run the playbook, you will get the report back, and then you will get, okay, like this run, this run, this run, this was successful, this was error, all those kind of things. So if you don't put the names yourself, you're going to basically get some you know, auto names from Ansible, and then finding it in the playbook might be difficult. So if you put your name yourself, then it's easier to find stuff. Then we define the task itself with basically with the module name. So in this case, basically, I'm setting the module name by apt. And again, if you know Ubuntu, if you know Debian, you know, then you can figure out basically more or less what this actually does. This is you know, like app, app, you know, from Debian and Ubuntu for installing so software things with that. Then we provide the parameters in a key value pair. 
Here, basically, I'm giving like first parameter, key is the name, value is MySQL server. The next key value pair, basically, well, you know, which actually, you know, I think this is like obvious that, okay, like I want to do something with app server with MySQL server. Then the next key value pair is state needs to be equal to present. So here I'm basically saying to, to Ansible, okay, make sure that MySQL server is present on manage node, which means if Ansible goes to, the, to manage node, it checks, okay, it has MySQL server, okay, I'm done here. I am not need, don't need to do anything. If it goes and see, okay, MySQL server is not there, then it's going to install it. Then we also have like update cache equal to yes. And basically this means is like, you know, like run up to get update before you actually start actually checking if MySQL server is there or not. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of arguments that basically you can push to every single module. Some of them basically have default values. So let me try to quickly show you that. I hope that I'm going to, oops, yes, so I'm here, but I think that I need to go outside of this one. I want to do one. Oops, no, so it works in this one. Okay, so it's here, okay. So, okay, this is going to be difficult. So basically you just go to docs, Ansible, and then you can see the list of all the modules. And you can see like there are all kind of modules here. Basically it's like, so you can do like for Windows, web, system, storage, source, remote, like you, know, you, you name it, you did it. For example, there is also like command modules. So if internet holds, yes, it holds. So basically here's the command module that I showed you before. And again, you can see here, okay, like here's like a description of, of a module itself, then basically parameters that you can pass to it. Again, it's also saying is it default or not. So if you don't pass some argument, and again, it's going to take default value from it. Also, you have some notes about it, you know, like in some other stuff. It's very good, also like example, how to run it. So, uh, and also of course, like the return value, sets, things like that. So it's a very good thing to check. So if you go, for example, in apt, that first time when you're actually dealing with some module, to check this and to read this. So again, like this is the apt module. So again, you see like all kinds of stuff, basically that what are the parameters, default values. So first time you're dealing with any kind of module, it's good to go here and look at it because for some situations, some modules actually request certain stuff to be present on the machine itself. Usually uh, it's basically like if you're dealing with the databases and things like that, then you need to install some Python modules and something like that to actually allow Ansible to actually do the work on the machine itself. In most cases, you don't need to add anything, so you just basically run Ansible, and Ansible will take care of everything for you. But in some situations, you need to basically add some stuff on the machine itself, so that's why you know, it's a good thing to basically just double check, and also like to check, are all, okay, where's my mouse? To, to just double check, okay, like, you know, like what kind of arguments you need to pass, you know, like what are default values, does the default value actually work for you or not? So it's a, just a good practice, go, Check quickly, doc. It's ver it's very good. It's very explanatory. Okay. So, like I said, in task I can put multiple tasks here. So here I'm adding basically the second task. Again, I'm adding the name because it's a good practice. I'm calling it "Is MySQL still running?" Again, clear stuff to understand. And then again, in this case, I'm using module service. Anybody dealing with the GNU Linux, basically they know what the service command tool basically does. It's like checks, okay, like is the service running, restarts, stops them and do all kind of stuff. So in this case I'm doing, it does exactly the same thing. So here I provide the name of the service that I'm interested in, it's MySQL. Again, I want to say state needs to be started, which means if MySQL service is already up and running, do nothing, if it's not running, basically start it. The last parameter here which says enabled equal yes, means okay, I want to make sure that this service is up and running on reboot time. So it's actually, if more nodes actually be, is restarted, you know, automatically start this service. Okay, so let's go to the next block, basically handlers. This is a very fun, fun one. So let us look quickly at the playbook again. So again, we have a playbook, we have hosts, define hosts, in this case it's web servers. Again, we define the list of tasks, right? Again, we have a name. Again, because it's a good practice, we say, Ensure mod VSG is enabled. Again, descriptive, everybody can understand it. In this case, we're dealing with Apache 2 module. And again, you know, like, probably name give it away, it's basically module for dealing with, with modules of Apache HTTP 2 server. Again, we're passing the parameters, state equal present. Again, if it's not there, ins install it. 
In this case, the module that I'm interested in is named v is VSGI, which basically says here, okay, like, if the mod VSGI is not present for Apache HTTP2 server, install it. If it's already there, don't do anything. And now we come to interesting part. We say here, notify. And basically here, we say, okay, notify restart Apache 2. So what actually we're doing here is saying, okay, in the case that VSGI is already present, you will not do anything else because it, everything is good. However, if it wasn't present and you install it, then I want you to notify restart Apache 2. So in this case, restart Apache 2 is actually a handler. And again, we also define handlers in similar way that we, defo we define the tasks. Again, like we have multiple handlers there. And as you can see, it's, it's very, it looks very similar basically to task itself. Again, it has a name, and in this case, the name is restart Apache 2. And you probably guessed, okay, these names are the same. So basically, I define the handler, I give the name to the handler, and then if I want to basically, for a handler to be used, and actually notify it through the task itself, I'm basically just using the same name. Which means whenever actually this task runs, if it does any kind of work, basically if it installs VSGI, it will notify the handler and then the handler will kick in. If I don't need to install VSGI, basically if the state was already in a good state, I will not touch a handler. And the handler again use the, again use the module, service. In this case again, name of a service that I'm interested in is Apache 2. And here I'm saying, okay, if I came here, restart the, the service. The great thing about handlers is that again, multiple uh, basically tasks can notify the same handler. But the handler will going to be run only once. So basically how it goes is actually like, your Ansible playbook, playbook is going to be run, it's going to go through all the tasks, all the notifiers basically are going to basically kick in, what needs to be kicked in, and then it's going to actually look, okay, which handlers are basically were notified, and run them basically in, in the order, but again, run it only once. Which means if I'm, for example, installing like the 15 modules for Apache, I wouldn't restart the, the patch server 15 times. I would restart it only once. So I will install all the modules and then I would restart it once, which is a great thing. Again, also what you can do is you can basically, from the handler, notify a handler, you know, if you want. So again, you can really like create crazy stuff here. Okay, last block of Ansible are roles. Uh, roles are actually, uh, used to create a more structure and basically more skeleton and reusability of our code, especially in a company. So basically the idea is that, you know, like in your company, you know, everybody, either everybody or people would create the roles, then you would sh actually share the roles among basically people inside the company, and then those roles would be reused. So let us look at roles and a little bit more details. So in order to create the role itself, you, you can basically, you need to run this command. So this is going to create a skeleton crew. Your for your role. Basically, you're going to say Ansible Galaxy, and it, again, Ansible Galaxy can be used not only to create roles, you can also use it to actually download roles from other places. So there's like a huge ecosystem already of created roles by other people that you can just tap into very easily. However, if for any reason either you can't find the role that you need or you have security reasons that you need to create your role in yourself, then you do this. Ansible Galaxy, in it, and then provide the name of the role. In this case, it's test role. What this is going to do is going to create initial skeleton for you. And it's going to look like this. So basically all these files and directories are going to be there. So actually let us now look, you know, what the hell is this, right? Because there's a lot of files here. So here, basically the name handlers, I think it, it kind of gives it away, right? Basically any kind of handler that you want to have inside the role, basically you're going to put them here. And again, whoever actually reuse your role is automatically going to load all the handlers basically there. So if you actually uh, you know, use the role inside the playbook, you will automatically going to get those handlers and then you can basically reference those, those handlers from your task and things like that. Again, we have our tasks, right? Again, I think it's like the names give it, a, give it away. So basically all the tasks related to this role that you want to basically have, you just put them here. Again, if any playbook basically include this role or anybody basically include this role, they're going to get all these tasks out of the box. And of course, this task can very easily, you know, reference all the handlers that are already defined. Then we have templates. 
So I didn't speak about the template so far. Uh, basically, uh, all these templates that you actually define in a role, again, can be wrote, used inside the role or anywhere that actually the role is included. What the templates are are basically, in the simplest way, explain like certain files where they have some placeholders to actually put some values in according to some parameters or variables or things like that. So for example, if you're thinking about the, for example, let's say like some Java E application or something like that, then if, or any kind of Java application, then you probably have property file. So for example, connection to the database, sorry, can be different on the dev, test, acceptance, and production, right? So basically then you create a template where basically the keys are always the same, but values can be different depending on are you in the dev or in production. Or for example, if you have like, you need to handle with like some Apache 2 configuration. So again, like, you know, certain things are going to be the same. Certain things are going to be different depending on which environment they are. So basically templates are going to be files like that with special placeholders to actually put some variables there. Again, you can make them very complex. You can make them very simple. Like it's your, your, your choice. If you want uh, with Ansible to change some configuration files but only one line, then you don't have to use the template. There's the ways how to do it basically with Ansible itself. But if you want to really change very complex configuration files, then the template is the way to go. Then, of course, we have variables. Again, like I said, if you want to basically customize behavior of certain row or, or certain templates, things like that, usually you're going to do it for the variables. So what you can basically do in the role itself, you can provide all the variables themselves and put the values there. <coughs> the similar thing is with defaults. So how it's actually going to go is, okay, if, this, if I put something in defaults, if I put something in variables, and then I include this role in some playbook, how it's going to look like when actually Ansible sees something that needs to be customized, first thing is going to check, okay, is, there, is it in the defaults, okay. Okay, that's the first value that I'm going to use. But then it's going to check, okay, is the variables there? Okay, if I have it also in variables, variables are going to overwrite whatever is in default. But also the last thing that it's going to check, okay, is does you have it in the playbook itself? So if it's also in the playbook, then the playbook wins. So basically, defaults is the first one. If there is nothing else, if it's in variables, it's going to use in variables. If it's in playbook, it's going to use playbook. So it's basically, you know. So you can also like provide certain defaults, normal defaults, and then you can customize it in variables and customize it even more in the playbook itself. You also have files. So basically here you can put any kind of files that you want for any reason to use in your handlers or tasks or templates, wherever, basically something that you want to copy for some reason. Again, there are use cases where you actually need this, there are use cases when you don't need this. Last but not the least, there is a metadata part where you can basically put all kind of metadata information about the role itself, especially like, okay, does this role depend on some other role? Because again, you can, this is basically the building blocks that you want to use to reuse it inside your code. And of course, for the people who like tests, we have also tests, right? Because again, if everything is written as a code, then we can also add tests, make sure that all is good, that nothing is broken, especially if somebody ch comes and changes the role. So let us look at how we can actually use the role in the playbook itself. It's very simple. Basically, again, we define the hosts. In this case, it's web servers. And again, then we list all the roles that we want to use. In this case, we're using two roles. First role is common, basically some common stuff. And then I can do some specific web server stuff. Like, for example, like the setting the load balancer, opening the ports, you know, DNS, whatever. So like I said, like we can use roles basically to create like the blocks that we can reuse and redo throughout our basically code. So basically this is how, like I said, all the blocks that Ansible consists of. So not a lot of blocks, but very powerful ones. So we have like inventory, modules, playbooks, handlers, and roles. Important thing to remember is actually the order of the things that's actually going to happen when you actually run the playbook. Because here in this role playbook, I have only roles. But still, I can still add handlers, I can still add tasks, I can still add variables, I can still add templates, I can still add all kind of stuff. So basically, how it's going to run, is going to basically go and first look at pre-tasks, and run all the pre-tasks, then it's going to run all the handlers basically connected to the pre-tasks. Then it's going to basically go for each role listed. So in my case, basically, first role common, then, and do everything inside that, related to role common. Then it's going to do everything related to the role's web servers. 
after this, it's going to start running all the tasks in the role itself. Then it's going to basically hit all the handlers notified by the task itself. Then it's going to run post tasks, and then it's basically going to run, okay? And, and then it's going to run all the basically handlers connected to the post tasks. So the order is very important to remember, especially if you have a multiple stuff happening in the playbooks, in, in the complex playbooks. Okay, so let us summarize. Basically, like I said, treat everything as a code. Make sure that everything is written as a code, that you have basically everything in the version control system, that you can easily go back, that you can do the code reviews, that basically you can you know, have the whole trail and make sure that it's everything as a code, infra as a code, you know, like all kind of, all the standard stuff. Again, automate everything. Make sure that everything is automated. Like I, for me, it's still like a surprise that I, all, that I still see in a lot of companies a lot of stuff happening manually. And usually people say, yeah, because we don't have time or it's because it's difficult. Or it's, it, please, you know, like doing things manually is just a waste of time. It's an error waiting to happen. Automate everything, create automatic pipelines for everything, all the unit tests, all the functional tests, end to end tests, like everything has to be automated because machines are great at that, we are terrible at that. So just make sure that everything is automated. Like I said, Ansible is extremely flexible and powerful. It can do whatever you can think of. Like I said, it can do a lot of stuff for you. It can do a lot of crazy stuff for you. There are a lot of roles and basically modules already out there. So like, you know, like I just quickly showed you on the documentation, it's like amount of ecosystem around Ansible is ridiculously big. So you can probably find whatever you need. And again, if you, if you can't find something that you need, adding new stuff is very easy. It, Ansible is written in Python, so you know, that's the only thing that you need to know. Just know the Python code. And again, remember, Ansible is just one tool, it's just one piece of a puzzle. Again, you need still a lot of tools and other stuff around it to basically make it much more powerful and basically to use all the power that's behind it. And again, if you don't like Ansible or you, or you don't feel that Ansible is the right tool for you, again, there's a lot of other tools out there that can basically do the similar thing, so look into that. Thank you. And I have two minutes so for questions. Okay, so the question is basically about the Jenkins and the combination with the Jenkins and Ansible. So again, like I said, it really depends from your use case to use case. For example, in one of the companies that I worked with, uh, what we did is basically we created all the pipelines and all, all the, the hooks and everything kicking from the Jenkins. But again, installation of the software itself on the machines we did for the Ansible because we needed to do some crazy stuff. We needed to do customization on the machine itself. So you know, then we kind of did the, com the combination of, okay, the Jenkins is basically the tasks, so I go and click the button, and go, the whole pipeline kicks in, but at one point it will call the Ansible with appropriate parameters, and then the Ansible is going to kick in. So again, it depends from the use case to the use case. Does that answer your question? Yep. yep. Well, uh, okay, so, so the question is, you know, like if you have container and you run the container, like should you then use Ansible? Well, I would probably say no. So if you already create the container and like you shouldn't change the container itself, you should create the new container. So the process of creating the new containers and you know, like and putting some stuff in place for a container that you can use Ansible for, but you know, changing the state of a container usually, is, is, I, 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 at least from, I would say probably no. It wouldn't be a use case. Use case. Uh, so the question is basically, is Ansible then only for physical and virtual machines? Uh, not really. Like I said, you, it, you can do whatever you can think of with Ansible. So again, like you can basically, uh, simple situation, what, they, what I had in one of the companies that I worked with, basically we had, okay, we had the code, and then we had uh, all the configuration that we need to basically create for the different environments. And again, that was kind of not really straightforward because it was very complex. We need to go to multiple systems to basically provide the, the, the passwords and all kind of credentials to actually get some stuff, then in real time unpack some stuff, basically put it in place again, zip it. So we, we had like to do crazy jumping through the hoops. So again, in that case, you know, 
we did all those kind of those crazy stuff in, in Ansible itself. And again, then we, when we package everything, then we just, you know, like, kicked in and said, okay, like, just create a Docker file, push the Docker file basically to repository and, and de delete the result. So, like I said, Ansible is very, very, very flexible. And again, it can do everything for you or it can do very small parts for you. So it, again, it, you know, for example, you, know, you can just say, okay, like, you know, here's the template file, just create from the template file, configuration file for environment itself. You can just do that small part in Ansible and you know, you're done with it in an easy way. Instead, you can, if you want to do that manually, then you will have to like either create some shell scripts or you know, create the Docker Compose. And again, it comes back to, to the company and the knowledge of the people. No. Does that answer your question? Uh, so, do, do, okay, so the question is because default communication is over SSH, what you do, with, of course, like with username and password. I don't have enough time because I also I think we were done, but there's like the whole documentation of like all the kind of crazy ways that you can do it. So you can either use like the, the password managers, you can use the key files, you can put like, there are like 15 or more like ways that you can do it. So the best thing is just go and you know, check on documentation. It's like, it's very, very like huge. <laughs> I have to run, so, yeah. Uh, you, you also, you can do that, do that with Ansible. So basically, like, uh, like I said, uh, what I saw in most cases, when you actually deal with Ansible and the databases, then you need to add some uh, Python modules on, on the machine itself. Because again, it's using them to actually then do all the, 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 the crazy stuff with, with the databases, creating the, you know, the tables, doing like users, whatever you. So again, you can do absolutely whatever you can think of.